So far in this lecture, we have learned that externalities are market failure. If there are negative externalities, for example, in production, producers produce too much and produce basically above what would be the efficient level of production. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that by producing, they also pollute the air or pollute the water um, or have some other negative effect or some other damage to other participants in the market. And they don't factor in that, that damage in their behavior. So what can we do then to, to remedy that? Especially what can we do if we cannot exploit the forces that underlie the cost theorem where we just bring the relevant parties to the negotiating table and let them figure that out themselves. Here we can't do that, or in many cases we can't do that. So then the government has to step in. And there are three remedies that the government can use to actually address the problem of negative externalities and to correct that market fix. One, it can levy a tax on whichever side of the market causes that negative externality. Two, it can subsidize the use or subsidize a certain behavior when that behavior is attached to a positive externality related to a positive externality. And the third one, not one that we will talk a lot about in this course, but is, is, is nonetheless very important, it can regulate the use. And so there is lots of examples um, f about regulation, you know, that, you, that for example, firms are only allowed to emit a certain amount of carbon dioxide, that when you buy a car, the amount of carbon dioxide it, it, its engine can emit is heavily regulated. That, for example, uh, during a pandemic, wearing masks indoors is mandatory. That is regulation. That is not a tax and is not a subsidy. It's, it's, it's regulation. So we, we have regulation as a tool very often. But we will mainly talk in this course about the other two tools because the regulation is oftentimes is, is an economic as well as a legal problem. And, and this, if you take a course in environmental economics, you will hear a lot about optimal regulation. Um, as an important instrument to remedy ex negative externality. We will talk here mainly about uh, taxation and subsidy, mainly actually about taxation. So we go back here to the example of the steelworks and the fishery, whereby the steelworks pollute the water, the fishery has to pay for deeper. So let's build this up from scratch. So we looked at it from the perspective of the steelworks. And so we have here a supply curve in that market, which is the marginal cost curve, and it's the private marginal cost curve of the steelworks. Now, we also have a demand curve, which is the marginal benefit and it is the private as well as the social marginal benefit. Now, in that market, the equilibrium price we learned is too low and the equilibrium quantity too high. So P and Q are respectively too low and too high. Why? Well, because there is another firm that suffers from a damage and we learned that this damage, the marginal damage here, is the difference between those two lines. So that red line is the social marginal cost. The marginal cost of production of steel, but plus the marginal cost of depolluting that river. And so the difference, the marginal cost of depolluting that river, that's the, the difference between those two lines, the, the vertical difference. So at the efficient level, the socially efficient level, we would actually have less production and the good would be sold at a higher price. So the question is then for a government, 
how do we go from A to B? And for that, it has various, um, it has various rules, or it has various instruments, apologies. So one is to regulate and say, to, to basically force firms to produce less, Right, so, so for example, um, one element of ca so-called cap and trade systems is to tell firms, okay, you can pollute a certain amount, and for everything, uh, for everything in addition to that, you have to either pay a fine or you have to buy a license for polluting more. Right? And that is an example for, for basically telling a firm, initially, you can only produce the amount Q star and nothing more. The other option is we can tax the, uh, the amount. So we, we, can, we can tax um, the good that they're selling. And that can have the same effect. How does this work? Well, the final price of the good um, will equal the marginal cost of the firm plus a tax. And the idea here is that, that we have a tax that is exactly as high as the marginal damage. And that brings us into the optimal level. Okay, so we, we use a tax to shift that firm's marginal cost curve up such that the firm then produces at a lower level, and and that and obviously part of that, that tax is then passed on to consumers in terms of high prices. But it brings us, if we do this well, if it, it brings us exactly to the point B that we want, the socially optimal level of consumption. Now this is in reality not so easy because obviously what we need to know is how big that marginal damage is. If it's about the pollution cost of a firm, well, that it, it, it may be possible to put a price tag on. In other instances, when it's about quality of life, you know, pollution reduces the quality of life of people, it's hard to put a price tag on. It's also hard to put a price tag on it if pollution has long run health consequences that are that we can only measure 30 years from now. It's very hard to. to they how big they are and what the optimal amount of production then is. So, so what all governments that use these instruments, be it regulation, be it taxation, or be it subsidies, are struggling with is to find the optimal amount. So uh, if you um, become one of the economists who work for, for ministries, I bet that part of your job will be to figure out these answers to these type of problems, how to use government instruments to correct for market failures and, and to find the optimal policy. That even if there are no political actors involved with vested interests, but even just putting a price tag here onto, onto a damage, like valuing the damage here is actually quite a hard thing to do. Now, let's look at this a little bit more formally, um, again, based on the amount, uh, sorry, based on the example of the steelworks and the fishery. A was the steelwork, B was the fishery. And what we have here is we model this, uh, this um, allocation problem as a missing market. So the idea is there is a market price for pollution R that brings the amount of pollution that A, the steelworks, wants to have, given its production targets, and the amount firm B is willing to accept into equilibrium. As you can imagine that Firm A wants to pollute as much as it, 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 it wants, and the only limit uh, it would have is, is its own uh, marginal cost curve and basically its, its own profit maximization. Okay? Firm B, on the other hand, wants to have as little pollution as possible. But if that's the case, then, then we could think about firm R compensating firm B 
And that compensation, so firm A compensating firm B, and then compensation, that price, brings the two into equilibrium so that the amount that firm A pollutes equals at that price the amount that firm B is willing to accept. So we start here with the, the profit functions of each of those firms. And in, for firm A, that what we have here now is firm A pays something for pollution and that gets transferred to firm B. We have here different superscripts because this is, these are now the, these reflect not the equilibrium amount of pollution, but what one party is willing to pollute or reduce pollution by and what the other party is willing to accept. And we will then see what the equilibrium price actually should look like. So we can take uh, through profit and maximization, we can just take the first order condition of each of those. So for the, the for firm A, if we take the first derivative with, with respect to uh, QA, what we're left with is P minus R minus C prime QA, and we assume an interior solution, so we simply set that equal to zero. Right? And we would do the same for firm B. Now, if we do that, we get those two first order conditions, and we can solve for R. So we can we take this and plug it up, uh, plug it into this equation, and we are left with this uh, this first order condition. And so, so we can see here. Uh, immediately that um, that looks very much like Samuelson's rule, like the rule that gives us the, uh, the efficient level of, in this case, production. Okay. So what's going on here is that we have now not, a, not different levels of, uh, of, of, of pollution that one is willing to accept and the other is willing to, to emit, but in equilibrium, the, the price will be such that the, the amount of pollution that one party emits, the other party is willing to accept, is equal. Right? So, so that, that's, that's the equilibrium condition we have. So both firms maximize their profits and both basically um, agree on a market price for pollution. And then we have the optimal level of pollution in that market, whereby the price simply equals the social marginal cost. Okay, so if you remember, this is the private marginal cost. This is the marginal damage. That's basically by how much the supply curve or the marginal cost curve gets shifted upward. So this derivation here basically shows us what I've illustrated previously through that shift in the curve. Now, these taxes that regulate either production or consumption are, have a long tradition in, in, in economics because the problem of negative externalities is not a new one, obviously. Um, negative externalities has, have always been there, I would assume, and uh, also economists for a very long time have studied them. And one of the most prominent economists studying them was Arthur Pigou, who also then invented this, or who was one of the first who, to write about taxes as a remedy for, for negative externalities. That's why this tax is named after him. So. I will make the example now of, of cigarette taxes, but you can think about all sorts of taxes that, that remedy external. So we have a carbon tax on anything that, that emits carbon dioxide, or more specifically a petrol tax. These are PIGU taxes. Here is, again, we, we create a disincentive for using these, uh, these. That doesn't mean that we should as a government have zero use of fuel, at least not in the current economy, um, but we should at least provide an incentive not to overuse fuel. 
Okay, so so to 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 balance basically the gain we have by having the life we have, and but also to, to balance that against the damage that that is that our lifestyle creates through emission. Actually, an interesting example for a Pigou tax, you can see, I presume this term as well, in a student union shop. So the student union shop at UCD charges more for coffee when you use a disposable cup. It used to be 40 cents more. Now these 40 cents are basically a Pigou tax and like, the student union shop, whether they're aware of that is a Pigou tax or not, I don't know, but I, I commend them for doing that because it encourages people to bring their own cup and then drink their coffee out of that and that reduces waste. Right? Because if we don't do that, then people drink too much coffee out of, uh, out of those disposable cups and, and we know that this creates a lot of waste and it's also actually quite costly for UCD to, to you know, the waste management and, and all those. That's a, an example, a very tangible example for students of a PIGU tax. So let's look at consumption. And uh, we know that the, the optimal choice of a consumer um, is simply where the, the marginal benefit that they get equals the marginal cost. Now, without the tax, um, the first order condition um, for, a, for a smoker, so A is a smoker, B is a non-smoker, that's the example here. Um, so for A, the, without a tax, A's utility would be maximized at the point where their marginal benefit from an additional cigarette equals the price of an additional in that market. Yeah, the price is the marginal cost. And so, so, so uh, very simply put, if you think about the market diagram, um, the, the marginal cost of, uh, of uh, cigarettes equals the, is, is the supply curve. The marginal benefit is the demand curve. And then we have this equilibrium point um, where the, the, the marginal benefit equals the marginal that's that's the optimal. Um, now, if we levy a tax, that obviously puts something on top of the price. Okay, so so again, we have now the 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 um, the marginal cost being being higher than it than it would have been before. So that's one element of 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 our reasoning okay so the idea here is that people don't just pay a price but people have to pay a price plus a tax now we also know what the efficient consumption of cigarettes would be now person b here is the non-smoker who suffers from the smoke and uh, so if we apply Samuelson's rule, which tells us what the optimal level of consumption of, of that, that good with the externality is, we have the social marginal benefit equals the social marginal cost, which is the, the same as the private market. Um, okay, so, so we, know, we know this and we know that we want to, that's basically our goal. But we want to reach this goal, the optimal level of production, sorry, the optimal level of consumption through a tax. And when you compare those two, two equations, it's very simple what that tax should be. The tax should be exactly what the marginal, the, 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 the marginal damage to that consumer would be. Okay? So the, the way this works here in this, this diagram, I'm just gonna zoom in, is that the tax works like a uh, like a shifter of the of the marginal benefit uh, of the marginal benefit curve? So the the um, social marginal benefit lies below the, uh, the 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 private marginal benefit 
that we can see here. And again, we have then a, a level of consumption um, here at point, apologies, at point A here, that is lower than at point B. So what is the tax? Well, the tax, so the marginal damage is basically the difference between those two lines and the tax should be exactly as big as the marginal damage. That's the logic of what we've shown here. Right? And, and we could do the same in, in, in production um, where we also had already the example where we have a um, marginal cost curve, the private marginal cost, and then we have basically this, this the, the social marginal cost curve that lies higher because we have this marginal damage. And that marginal damage has to equal the tax or the tax has to equal the marginal damage to reach the optimal point of the optimal level of production. So we've seen here in this video that Pigou, how Pigou taxes work. And let me all once again reiterate that Pigou taxes are something you come across very, very often. Keep an eye out if you find out about a tax. Think about well, what is the externality that, that may be attached to the behavior that or to, to either the consumption or production of a certain good. Um, and, and, and does that tax remedy that, uh, that, that externality? Not every tax is a Pigou tax. For example, an income tax is not a Pigou tax, but a tax on cigarettes, a tax on the use of disposable cu cups, a tax on carbon. These are all examples of Pigou taxes. They are very, very common. 